Welcome to the Real Estate Strategies Podcast, a place for conversations that matter in order to obtain infinite wealth. I'm your host, Ken McElroy. This show is meant to keep you updated on what is going on in real estate while getting you on track to have infinite wealth and financial freedom. This episode, as well as all the others, can be downloaded on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and various other platforms so that you're able to listen on the go. To get my weekly newsletter where we keep these conversations going and explore the trending topics in real estate today, please go to www.kenmcelroy.com slash news. Let's dive into today's episode. Hey, everybody. It's Ken and Daniil. Hello. What's going on? And I'm really excited to have Joe Chantry on the line here. Joe, hello. Hey, Ken. How are you? Good, 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 good. So one of the cool things about, I think, being in this business and teaching is to, you know, get acquainted to and follow other people on social media. And uh, Joe is definitely someone that we follow. Yeah, he has a great Instagram account, Your First Million. Yep. So uh, for those of you who don't know, go check out First Million. So, but Joe... First of all, I want to find out, you know, how you grew that to the to the point that you did. And and obviously I got your book. Thank you for sending me that. We're going to talk a, a little bit about that. But really what when Daniel and I were talking about, you know, you as a guest, uh, what what really I thought was the best was that you and you, and your wife are both working full time. Yeah, you're a sheriff's deputy and she's a nurse. And somehow on those salaries working full time, you're able to become financially free. And that's actually what I really want to kind of focus on. Bless you. Um, I want to talk about everything here, but can you kind of walk us through, you know, your journey, you know, on, on um, obviously financial freedom you were focused on, but also on the real estate education piece, trying to get out of the rat race and when you started. Um, Cause I think the whole story is fascinating. And I think a lot of people sometimes sit back and they look at, you know, someday it's going to happen to you and Man, it might even ha- be happening where it's like, you know, he has the golden touch, you know, he started with money, you know, whatever. And you and I both know that's not exactly what happened to either of us. So can you maybe start like, where were you when you had this aha moment? And, and, uh, and, and let's start there. Sure. Absolutely. Well, I, uh, I grew up, um, pretty middle class for the most part. Uh, as I got a little bit older into my teenage years, my parents started doing a little bit better. So I found, picked up a few books off his bookshelf, you know, uh, Robert Kiyosaki's Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Um, he had a couple books by Robert G. Allen, you know, Nothing Down and Multiple Streams of Income. So I got very into uh, reading those kinds of books, uh, probably at about 15 or 16 years old. Um, so I uh, just started studying people that were you know, stock investors, uh, entrepreneurs, and uh, real estate investors. And so I kind of started to sum it up. And I decided uh, by the time I think I was maybe 17, I'm going to be a real estate investor, whether I decide to start a business or whether I decide to go into a different career path. Either way, I'm going to invest in real estate. Um, So the hard part was it uh, takes a little bit, you know, to get to a point where you can get loans, right? Um, so that's uh, seventeen. My wife, that's seventeen, <laughs> right? So I didn't get to start quite that young, uh, but I started the education process that early, and I continued to learn and learn and learn, and I discovered bigger pockets and all of those things. So, what made you start so young? Like, what made you? What was? What were you thinking? As I you're had sitting to pay there, my kids to watch read, read Rich Dad Poor Dad. So, as I don't you're know sitting what there it was. with no money, you're just like, I want to yeah. own real estate one day. You know, I, I had a, a cousin that was a couple years younger than me at the time, and I remember I had overheard that uh, his mom owed him several thousand dollars. Right? I think it was five or six thousand dollars. And to me, I was like how is that possible? He's like 14, right? Like, (laughs) I think the most money I had had at that point might've been $1,500, right? And uh, because you earn it and then you spend it and, you know, you think I just got to make more to be wealthy, but, you know, you start to learn how money works and you realize that that's not necessarily the case. Um, And so that was kind of a wake up call for me. Like if I got, I have a cousin who's several years younger than I am. 
who has all this money somehow, you know, and what am I doing differently? Right. And so that kind of was the mental shift for me. Okay, nice, nice. And then as you started to make money, then you decided, okay, now I'm going to start saving some money for a rental or a house or where did you start? Um, So I, let's see, we, I went to the Sheriff's Academy in 2011 and started my career in 2012. Um, And that was right about the same time that my wife uh, started as a nurse. She'd finished her nursing program. And so we decided, okay, now we have our careers and we're making a career level income. We're going to live off of one of those incomes and the other income we're just going to put away for investing. And, um, you know, we're going to do what we can to avoid that lifestyle creep, right? Because as you know, both of us would get raises and most people get, get a raise and then now they can go get a new car payment or a new, uh, you know, a new couch or, or whatever it is. Right. And so for us, we thought, Hey, we're going to set this budget and we're going to stick to it. Um, and of course we budget things for entertainment and we still go on vacations and we go out to dinner, but we, uh, do a lot less than we could. Right. And so we, we probably save about 40% of our income and that's where we started. And even to this day, uh, almost 10 years later, we're still doing that. Um, so we bought our first house in 2013. Um, it was just a small three bed, two bath in the Sacramento area. Um, we bought it with an FHA loan. And it's funny at the time, it was actually, it was really hard for us to get a house. We had made multiple offers, uh, lots of houses in our neighborhood, but, um, at that time prices were low, but because they were so low, they were getting bought up quick. You know, uh, we had, there were a lot of cash buyers and we'd call our realtor and say, Hey, what's the status? We haven't heard anything on such and such house. And he said, well, they have 45 offers and half of them were cash and ours is an FHA. So we might not hear anything back. (laughs) Right. Um, we actually convinced our landlord at the time to sell us the house that we were living in. And so it was an off market deal. And so we kind of got lucky to get in and, uh, we got it at a good time. That was our first house, but because we were able to do an FHA loan, we had some savings and we were continuing to save. Um, so about a year later, we ended up buying our first rental property and I kind of, um, was a little bit aggressive (laughs) for, for most starting real estate investors. I looked at a lot of the bigger companies and big time investors. And I thought, you know, these guys look all over the country for these markets that are poised for growth. You know, most people, I think just buy a house in their backyard somewhere and manage it themselves. But I thought, I'm going to, I'm going to do what they do and figure out how I can do this a little bit more remotely and find a place that I have really good odds and that I can make more money. And so I'd studied lots of different markets and I narrowed it down to a few and I decided on Ogden, Utah at the time. And this is 2014. Um, and you were still uh, in California, correct? We were still in in California. Yeah. Um, and I, I'd never been to Ogden, but I learned everything I could about it. Uh, I talked to some other, I met some other investors on bigger pockets that were investing in that market and got to know them and talk to them about it. Um, and we just decided that's what we're going to do. And it's going to be a kind of make or break thing. I didn't really know what to expect because I hadn't had a rental property before. Um, but we thought we got to do it at some point or, or, or nothing's going to happen. Right. So, uh, my brother and I flew out there. And we looked at a couple of properties for sale. Um, and I actually met a, uh, a, a realtor who was also had a small property management company and I got to know him really well. And so I kind of started to set up a team, right? And uh, we eventually found a triplex that was for sale that we purchased. Um, and I think we put 25% down. It was $143,000 at the time. So for us, that was a big deal, right? Their first large down payment on a property. Um, but after about six months, you know, of being nervous and cautious, I thought yeah, this isn't really that bad. You know, I mean, the rent comes in and the property manager takes care of when there's small maintenance issues. And it, we, I think we can do this. Right. Um, and so every year we continued to save money and year after year, we bought uh, another one every year after that. And so uh, we got to about 2017 and the market had really taken off there. Um, Rents had also risen, but not quite as quickly as as values had. And so it was starting to become harder and harder to find uh, properties that had as much cash flow or or they would break even. Um, And so I started to think, well, 
I did this once, I can do it again, right? And so I started looking at other markets and and trying to, you know, at that time my Instagram account had grown too. And so I had met uh, you know, lots of people in different markets um, who were also doing real estate. And we decided on Kansas City was next. Uh, and so we started buying there. And so um, you know, up to today we have I think 11 properties consisting of about 28 units between um, our one rental house here in Sacramento. Uh, we have two triplexes in Utah. We sold one in 2020. Um, and then we have, let's see, <laughs> I've started to lose track. <laughs> we have three, four plexes in Kansas city. And then, uh, this last May, we bought a package of four duplexes just outside of Kansas city. So that's where we're kind of at today. So Joe, first of all, congratulations. What a great story <laughs> that is. I, that is literally the American dream. Um, you know, on um, there's a lot of things to talk about there. I, I wrote down a bunch of stuff I want to get into. But r w today, you know, call it 10 years since uh, that, you know, I guess 2012 when you you you, you got out of the academy and your, and your wife uh, became a nurse. It's been uh, almost 10 years. Right. So what do you think those 28 units are worth like today if you were to sell off everything not that you're going to yeah of course um they're worth somewhere between maybe 3.2 million and 3.5 million so so you're you're you know what you were able to do in a very short period of time is grow your net worth to somewhere between three and four million dollars well, the, the total value of the property is about $3 million. I think our net worth just this year has reached about $2 million. So, okay. Yeah. Well, pretty, pretty darn good. But as a yeah. sheriff's <laughs> deputy and as a nurse, you know, I mean, that's very impressive. I think that's a lot of our audience yeah. that's sitting out there wondering how they can do that. Yeah. Yeah. Not to mention the fact, the um, you know, the, the reoccurring cash flow is kind of nice too, right? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> well, that way you could be a sheriff because you want to be a sheriff. <laughs> right, right. Right, right. So let's 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 go back real quick and talk. I think there's some key points that um, um, that you brought up that I wrote down. The first one is the lifestyle creep, is I think what you said, which I think is a really important piece that doesn't get brought a lot of attention. I love that title. Of, yeah, you know, what he oh, called yeah. it it's, too. Well, you got to give the credit to Joe. It's, it's Joe's. <laughs> it's Joe's. I've term. heard it somewhere. It's not mine. I can't lifestyle remember who creep. said it, but I've heard it. Yeah. So. Everyone falls into this. Even I fell into this. You've fallen into this. You know, like when you make a little bit more, you naturally want a, you know, a bigger apartment. You don't want to take on more debt. You want a nicer car, you know, and then your first job. I don't know how you had that kind of discipline at 2012. Um, but how did you guys fight those forces? And, um, you, you know, and, and let's talk a little bit about, you know, the relationship the you know the you guys have to be partners you know uh this we, you know what happens a lot of times guys is uh, you know like daniel and i we do a lot of stuff together most of the stuff together if we go to a conference we're reading a book we're doing it together we're talking about things together it and where i where i see potential problems a lot of times is where people go let's say personal development or they have you know whatever it is that they have and you know one of the spouses isn't there sometimes Sometimes it's the woman that's there. Sometimes it's um, the 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 uh, the husband that's there. Let's say, and so you know, getting on the same page. Um, you know, what was that like? I um, it took a little bit in the beginning. Um, I think, fortunately, Heather uh, always kind of had the same mentality to a degree as well. It, it just kind of worked. I mean. Like you were saying, it, it, the lifestyle creep does happen. And it's something I think, you know, every year or maybe every couple of months, you have to go back and say, hey, you just have to keep it in check. And so, but I think, um, yeah, just uh, I, Heather is uh, actively involved in all of the real estate with me. I mean, I do a lot of the, uh, a lot of the brunt end of it, but I, all of our decisions are made together. Uh, we study the markets together. I think when it really started to work really well was when she started to see the results too, right? And so when our net worth started to grow and then the cash flow started coming in, she was like, hey, he's 
he knows what he's talking about. Let's let's <laughs> right, do this together, right? right. right? <laughs> so, yeah. Well, well, so, it's yeah. a fine balance, you know, on the lifestyle creep. I mean, if you're working harder and making more money, you do want to do nicer things for yourself, you know, to an extent, right? But the goal is to balance, okay, you know, I work some extra hours or I got a promotion, so I'm going to allow myself this versus I'm making an extra, you know, 20 grand a year and we, I just want to spend it. You know what I mean? There's a fine balance and a lot of conversations that happen, you know, within that. Yeah. Yeah. That's very, very, very true. So now, so now you're obviously in a fantastic position. You've got this passive income, you know, you're now facing tax issues if you sell. And so uh, we'll get into that in a, in a second, but, but I want to, um, you know, I want to just kind of uh, talk about that lifestyle creep and the discipline. Y- you know, like um, <clears throat> a lot of people know, like Warren Buffett. There's, you know, they always talk about the kind of truck he still drives and all these years. And and so, uh, you know, did you uh, were you ch- switching out your cars? Or what were you doing? What was your kind of lifestyle like during that period of time? And did anybody know what you were doing? Like that you were working with? Uh, so. I, I did buy a car, uh, when I started my career, it was a 2013, uh, Toyota Prius, you know, I didn't go crazy, but I, but I needed a car. Um, and then, uh, my wife had a car already that we, that she owned free and clear. And so, um, I still drive that car today. That's <laughs> so my point. It's, yeah. It's, That's uh, my point, it's folks. Nothing, <laughs> yeah, it's, right? it's nothing nice, but, but you know, it's maybe got half its life left. And so, um, yeah, people I think know, cause you know, even at work, right. And I was a training officer for several years and I kind of tell some of the new guys like, Hey, don't go out and buy the brand new Raptor, you know, and get an $800 car payment. You don't need to do that. You, you know, we all make the same amount of money here. You don't have to act like you're rich. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, just get what, get something you need. And then, uh, you know, it can be nice, but keep it, keep it reasonable, you know? And so, yeah. yeah. So I still drive the same car. Uh, both our cars are paid off and we're not, going to be getting any new cars anytime soon. So. Good for you. That that lifestyle creep, guys, that can get away from me and, and it can kill your dreams. Well, I think that lifestyle creep, you know, when people say, you know, I can't afford to invest in real estate, I can't save any money. I mean, there are some people that really, really, really are tight and, and are having a hard time. But I think a lot of times, you know, people say, well, I have to have this new car or I have to get a new outfit for this dinner or I have to do all these things. And, you know, to Joe's point, you know, they think when they start to make more money, then they'll be able to afford to save and invest in real estate. But, you know, when they make more money, they want the even nicer car and the even nicer watch and the even nicer stuff. And it just gets chipped away. And then they never get to that point where when two people living on modest incomes, a nurse and a sheriff's deputy are able to put aside basically almost one whole income, you know, that's true dedication. And that's truly, you know, living, you know, in order to to invest, you know, that is your goal, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, so, um, let's talk about that discipline before we kind of, uh, move to the next one. So, so you obviously had two salaries coming in and, um, you know, were you guys, did you own a home? Were you renting during the, uh, during that period of time or w- w- what sacrifices did you make? Let's say in the first, you know, three to four years, because that's really probably the hardest time financially. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so our first year uh, as working professionals, uh, we were renting. Um, that was uh, 2012, um, and then we bought our house in 2013. And um, you know, we look at at you know, for example, we w- the mortgage broker we were talking to right when we were getting ready to buy a house. Um, I think at the time we qualified for you know seven hundred thousand dollars. You know, um, but to me, I'm like, what? We don't need. We don't need. Uh, a McMansion right now, right? Like we need something that is going to be affordable that uh, might be similar to what we're paying right now in rent. My outlook was I want to buy something that's going to be a rental property someday. Um, and so that's why we settled on our the house that we were renting, um, you know, because it was it's a nice rental for us today. Um, but yeah, it, um, you know, when when the mortgage broker tells you, yeah, you can get you, you've been pre qualified for $700,000, you know. Uh, that doesn't mean you need to buy a seven hundred thousand dollar house. Yes, right? yeah, that's exactly <laughs> what I was going to say. So, yeah. what you in your head because you had read these books and prepared yourself for this moment, you're thinking, how do I get a house and a rental, uh, and and qualify for that? Not how do I maximize my lifestyle by a bigger house, right? 
When a lot of people do that, a lot of people, you know, they want that big house and the best neighborhood with all the five bedrooms, even though they only need three of them and, you know, all of the things. Right. And that's a big piece of it, because really for that house, you could get a more modest house and a rental almost for the same cost. Right. right? And then I think that's a rabbit hole. A lot of people fall down is they want the nice house to prove that they're, you know, doing well or something like that. Yep, that's part of that lifestyle creep. You know? Yeah. So yeah, most people max out. You know, if if they if somebody says, "Hey, you could afford this," you know, they go for it, right? And then they try to figure it out and make it work. And what you did was you took the foot off the gas and said, "Okay, how do I do both? How do I get a home, get a rental house that?" that provides passive income. So um, let's talk about that 2013 property that you that you got off market, okay? Because a lot, a lot of people right now, people are complaining about this exact same thing. And I think a lot of times, you, you know, people forget, like, you know, they're in the moment today, like it's hard, deals are hard to find. Do we find one of the cash flows? Is it gonna blah, 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 same stuff. I've seen it over and over and over and over and over. In 2013, you experienced it, 45 offers, half of them cash. Um, what you did somehow was you found a place off market and you got to get creative, right? So can you walk through that process a little bit right now? Because you kept getting no's and you just kept punching through and said, I'm going to do this. Why don't you uh, talk you know, to, to the people listening right now? Because I think this is happening right now. People are getting discouraged because they're getting priced out. There's all cash offers, et cetera, et cetera. Now they're blaming Wall Street or you know institutions buying up houses or whatever. But the point is the issue is the exact same. A lot of offers, a lot of cash. Yeah. So uh, basically what we did is we were making all of these offers on these houses and getting a bunch of no's or, or getting nothing back. Um, And we uh, my wife actually had the idea and she said, you know, let's uh, let's reach out to our landlord and see if he wants to sell the house. You know, Uh, we've been renting here for a couple of years and um, we've been great tenants and uh, you know, maybe he'd be willing to, to help us out a little bit. And at first he didn't want to, Um, you know, the house was, he bought it the house at a lot higher price than what it was worth in 2013. And so that made it a little bit more difficult because he was starting to see it come back up a little bit. And uh, so we actually uh, started talking to him and, and we were like, well, what if we paid a little bit more than what it's, what it's worth right now to try to get you closer to what you bought it for, you know? Um, And so that's when he kind of decided, yeah, I think, I think we can work something out. And so uh, I think the price that we agreed on was 195,000 and the houses on our street were selling for about 180,000 at that time. Um, But what was crazy is by the time that we got the property under contract and we actually closed or or before we closed, when it appraised, it appraised at 195. So prices had already caught up to what uh, we were buying it for. So it kind of worked out a win-win for both of us. But um, to your point, I think, I think, uh, what really worked for us was just, just talking to them. Right. And like opening that dialogue. Um, and then later in our career, you know, the, this four pack of, uh, duplexes we bought earlier this year, that was an off market deal. And it really comes down to building relationships with people and, and talking to people, you know, and you're able to not have to compete with just whatever's on the MLS. Right. Right. And so what is that house worth today? Uh, that house is worth about, somewhere between 460 and 480. So it's it's more than doubled since we bought it. So there you go, folks. Yeah. And uh, and what's interesting is that it was a $15,000 issue at the time. So, you know, so now, you know, you're, you've got, uh, well, close to 200 grand of additional equity in something that you took initiative on only seven years ago. And uh, you could have lost it for 15 grand. Yeah. Well, and since then we'd use some of the some of that equity to buy more cash flowing assets, right? And so, you know, not only are we continuing to save money to make down payments, but if things are starting to snowball, right? Because we have equity in some of our other properties and stuff like that. So when I, I always tell people that, you know, the first one's the hardest, right? Because you have nothing, you're starting at nothing, and you have to save for the whole down payment. But then after you start getting your first rental and there's tenants in there, you then have, you know, their cash flow coming in and it kind of snowballs faster 
each one that you get, you know, but that first one's always hard because. Well, and there's a mental barrier too, because you haven't done it before. Right. And, you know, you read books and you talk to people and it's like, it doesn't seem that hard, but because you haven't stepped foot across that line yet, there's that mental barrier, you know? And then once, and it happened to me when we were buying our first rental out of state too, it was a mental thing. Now I have a rental here in Sacramento and lots of them out of state and it's not much different, you know, but it was a mental thing. Yep, it is. It's so really Heather's the star. <laughs> Heather is the, the, <laughs> the star. That's for sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's uh, the power of the partnership, folks. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, it was her idea. So, um, okay. So let's talk a little before we t- uh, talk about market, because uh, I do want to talk about that because I think a lot of, you know, we always say start local, start small if you can. You obviously did do that, but then you branched out. But I want to talk about social media a little bit and the power of social media because, um, you know, it's honestly, I think it's still kind of finding its way. Obviously, you can go on there and spend a ton of time on there and, and have, you know, nothing to show for your efforts or you can use it. And, and so let's talk about a little bit about how you used it. Cause you've got quite a following now and you know, it's a, that's evolved to a book. It's evolved to new markets. It, you know, you found property managers and properties you're in Kansas city. So let's talk about that piece and how it's really helped you uh, achieve some of your goals. And you're still only 32 years old, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, it kind of started, um, my, I have a younger brother that's a couple of years younger. When Instagram was first kind of new, uh, he got on there and kind of started posting stuff about cars. He's a car fanatic. And um, his page just kind of took off over time. He continued to post, uh, you know, he would meet people on social media and they'd say, hey, you know, you should feature my car. And he, you know, kind of built a little network like that. And, uh, you know, before we knew it, I think he'd been doing it for about a year and had like 50,000 followers. And so that's when it kind of started to get my attention. Like he was actually meeting people and, and building a, a a following, you know? Um, and so a couple of years after he started, I decided, you know, I, I'm going to start a a financial page and just kind of do it for motivation and, and maybe I'll meet some cool people. Um, and so that's what I started doing. And, uh, I, Instagram has changed a lot since, since it started and it's always changing the algorithms. And he got to over a million followers, by the way, uh, you know, just a few years after that. I mean, he just, I don't know if it was the timing or the content, but, um, my, I got a little bit of the tail end of that, that big growth. Um, but it has done, uh, I wouldn't be where I'm at today in the same respect without social media. Um, I have met all kinds of people, um, that have, that have brought deals to me that have, um, you know, given me insights on different markets. Um, and I've been able to help other people in the same way, you know? And so it's, it's, it's very interesting how things are evolving and and it's just changing how we communicate with people. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I, I'm glad you went into that because I, I think, I too was resistant, <laughs> oddly enough. You know, I had my way of doing stuff and, you know, and, and you know, you got, you get pigeonholed a lot of times into, you know, especially when you have success and, and uh, you know, I had already had a fair amount and, 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 and uh, you know, financially and buying real estate and all that kind of stuff. But <clears throat> all of a sudden, you know, what happens is you get connected to this entire world of people that, that like, to your point, you can help and help you. And it can be reciprocal if you use it that way. And, and I, I think that, uh, you know, it's going to be one of those continually changing things, but, um, you know, what are some, what are some things that, that big nuggets that you got from being out there with, um, you know, your first million. I love that title, by the way, you guys need to go to that, your first million. Uh, that must've been your goal, I guess, when you started it. Is that what it was? Oh, absolutely. I mean, my, my first goal was, Hey, I want to, I want to get to a million dollars net worth. Right. And, um, that's actually the title of my book is the 24 things to help me achieve a $1 million net worth by, by age 30. And, uh, of course a million isn't what it used to be. Um, you know, but I think it's still an important milestone, you know, for people. And I think it, you know, you hit that. Um, yeah, I mean, some of the things, uh, 
you know, I, I think it's just been some of the people that I've been able to meet that I wouldn't have otherwise been able to meet, you know, um, and relationships with people all across the country and even the world, but mostly across the country um, in different states that I've met that have just really um, made things a lot more possible to to continue to build our 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 business. Right. Um, that's that's been the main thing for me. It's just the the networking. Yeah, for sure. Uh, but I want people to go back to before we jump to the next step. Um, imagine you're 23 years old and you, your goal is to say you 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 want a million dollars in net worth. <clears throat> it seems like a million miles away, right? Yeah. It really, I mean, I know, you know, and everybody needs to go there and remember that. And um, so now, now that you've hit it, obviously you've got some incredible momentum, I'm sure, just like a lot of people do when they start planting the seeds. Uh, but, but um, you know, um, a sheriff and a nurse, and uh, you know we're gonna we're gonna do a million dollars in net worth by the time we're thirty. That was one big lofty goal, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I think I, I think getting started early was a was a big reason we were able to achieve that, like you said. Um, but it was still at the time I I didn't know if it was possible. You know, for us, I'd seen other people do it, but you know, it was like, hey, let's. Uh, give it our best crack at it. So, yeah. Well, congratulations for one, for having the foresight of putting something big and lofty out there. And then, you, you know, it's, I always tell people, you know, if, if you don't know what direction you're going, uh, the world will take you where they want, you know? And, um, and so, um, at least you had it out there and you guys, you, you and your, your wife can sit down every year and evaluate where you are and you can make adjustments. And I mean, I have those goals personally. I have those goals in my, in my business. And I think that's part of the importance of actually setting something out there that, that, that feels uncomfortable a little bit. Right. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And one of the things that I find fascinating, you know, is we always tell people to invest in your own backyard, right? Because that's just a better, you know, it, it's an easier strategy because you understand the area and you know the area. However, in Joe's case, you know, he's in California and it's it's tough. Um, you know, Joe, can you, can you touch on the fact of why you decided not to invest in California and why you decided to look elsewhere? Yeah, I mean, uh, there's two main reasons. The first one was um, even at that time in 2013, uh, if we were to have bought a house or a duplex, um, you know, the rents weren't high enough to to cash flow well, right? Unless we put a significant amount of money down. But um, and so that was kind of a challenge was finding, you know, solid cash flow. It was it it. It was there at that time, but but it was it was few and far between. Um, and then part of the other part uh, to that was, um, you know, I had knew that California was a very uh, tenant friendly state, right? And I guess there's there's not much wrong with that, except unless you're a landlord, right? <laughs> right, exactly. As, uh, you know, as we've seen over, especially the last couple of years, um, you know, it can it can costs you financially as a landlord if you're if you're not in the right market, you know, because of the laws. And so um, that was one of the main reasons that we decided, hey, we got to look elsewhere because um, if we're going to build our portfolio here, um, you know, we might run into some issues. So. Yeah. Well, and people should take note because, um, you know, it, it really Joe and Heather should have invested in the state they live in. Right. But they didn't because of some of the policies that are there. Uh, and by the way, that's why we don't invest in California. And so, you know, sometimes that's not um, re really discussed. It's overlooked a bit, well, you know, so your money went to Ogden. Um, and so I'm, by the way, if you guys don't know, Ogden's, you know, where you mail your IRS checks to. Uh, you yeah, know? yeah, they're a so big IRS uh, I, That's why center, I know Ogden, sure. right? And I've been to actually <laughs> Ogden, oddly enough. I have friends that uh, have companies in Ogden and Logan and Salt Lake City. But um, but yeah, let's talk about Ogden and, and what you saw. Was it, um, you obviously went there and now you're heavily there, but, and then did you expect it to jump like it's jumped? Because it's really jumped. Yeah, not this much. Um, you know, I looked at Ogden and I, I saw the population was growing. 
I saw there were some companies moving there, you know, so there was going to be some job growth. Um, the, the vacancy rates were relatively low and, and shrinking. Um, and then Utah is a generally a pretty landlord friendly state. So it kind of checked all of those boxes for me. Um, and so that's when we decided to go out there and really kind of get boots on the ground and look at properties and try to meet some people. So I think um, it's important that you just said that, though. I think it's important that you went out there and put your boots on the ground and checked out the area because so many times, you know, first time uh, uh, investors, they hear somewhere is good. They see the listing, they buy it and they have no idea, you know, what the community is about, where they're buying in, you know, all of that. Well, and real estate is so local, right? We know that, you know, depending on the neighborhood, you can have a, a great pocket just a block away from a really bad pocket, right? And so I wanted to know, hey, where are the areas I want to stay away from? Where are the areas I want to be? Where are the areas that are kind of changing, right? Um, from a maybe not as good area into a better area. Um, and so, yeah, I, I we've never bought in a property. Well, I have bought in a property sight unseen, but I've never bought in a neighborhood that I haven't been to and walked, right? So. Um, you know, once we're established, I'm a little bit more comfortable relying on some of my team for that. But if I know exactly where it's located and I've been on that street, you know what I mean? Um, and so, yeah, I, li I like to go there and, and actually get a feel, uh, for the, the market. Well, one of the other things I loved, uh, Joe, that you talked about was, you know, really it boiled down to math. Right. Like you, you knew that you could cash flow in Sacramento, but you really uh, had a significantly better cash flow in Ogden. And I think this is important, guys, like uh, because it's it's, you know, whether you invest that amount of money in Sacramento or whether you inv invest it in Ogden, the returns can be very different. And it's the same amount of money but the return on the money can be significantly higher somewhere else. But you do have to have, and you touched briefly on the team piece. You obviously found a great property manager there at the time. So um, what are some of the potential risks that you found or have found and, and were trying to mitigate before you started to invest outside of, of your comfort area? Sure. Uh, well, uh, I guess kind of going back to kind of that mental barrier the first time, you know, I had this fear, like, you know, what if, uh, you know, I, I don't get to see or meet the tenants. I don't know what they're like, you know, um, I'm just kind of relying on someone else to, to vet them and, and to fill those vacancies when they arise. Um, you know, I, when maintenance issues come up, you know, I, one of my fears was, Hey, I, I don't know how bad it is. Right. It, you know, um, if, if, an HVAC system goes out or something, you know, and, uh, the management company says it's going to be $5,000 to replace. How do I know if that's competitive or not? Right. Unless, uh, you know, I, if it was in my backyard, I can kind of get multiple quotes or, you know, it's a little bit different, but, um, but ultimately it really isn't that much different than investing in your backyard. Um, especially when you've built a, a good team, you know, that, that, um, and once you've, uh, you know, done one deal with them and then several, and they're managing your, your properties for you. You know, it's, it's in their best interest to, uh, you know, be upfront with you, be honest with you. And, and because they know you're growing a portfolio, right. And so when you win, they win. Um, and so that's really been how we've overcome that, you know? Yeah. Well, it's uh, awesome. Okay. So then you obviously, you know, you saw Ogden kind of you know, peak and, uh, you're like, okay, time for a new market. And did that come through social media or you had, did you have a network at that point? And I, you know, what made you decide to go there next? Because this is a fascinating piece, you know, on, when people are trying to figure out where to put your money. I think social media had a big influence on that. Um, I had met several other investors, uh, you know, a really good realtor, um, and some property managers all in Kansas city. Um, and so that definitely weighed heavily on my decision. Um, um, but having that, uh, network a little bit established beforehand definitely made the decision uh, a lot easier to choose Kansas city. 
Yeah, definitely. And, you know, you always just came back to the numbers. So, you know, you saw that the numbers worked better in Kansas City. You saw the numbers worked in Ogden. You know, I think a lot of people, they get really emotional or they get attached to the price. You know, I see that a lot on our social media comments. Um, Hey, you know, I can get a house in the Midwest for $80,000, $80,000, you know, but there's no, um, they, nobody's attaching a number to that. You know what I mean? So sure, you can get it for 80000 Is it going to sit vacant? What's the area like? What are the rents like? What's the payment what are the property like? property taxes like? Yeah, Correct. Exactly. Yep. So, so I think that people get so stuck on these numbers that they forego, you know, the, the other numbers, you know? And yeah. so uh, I think it's really great that you calculated all that out. And that's probably a big part of the reason you were, you've been so successful. Yeah. The other thing that I just want to point out to everybody is the cool part about real estate, in my opinion, is that markets cycle up and down. They just do naturally based on a number of factors. So just like stocks. So the way I look at diversification, you know, even though I'm heavy in real estate, you know, Phoenix is different than Tucson and Tucson is different than Dallas and Dallas is different than San Antonio and San Antonio is different than Austin. And so what happens is each of these towns and cities and sub markets, they have a life of their own. And, you know, so if you dig down, you can really diversify and, and, and still do well. And I think what happens a lot of times, Joe, is we get this, you know, these, these questions is, you know, oh, that when's real estate going to crash or, or, um, you know, or, you know, something very specific they want an answer. Um, really, the, 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 I think the, uh, the brilliance is to, to go find that next emerging market, like, like an Ogden or like a Kansas city and, and, or, or wherever it might be. And, uh, so you and Heather, instead of, staying local in Sacramento and saying, okay, got to wait until the next cycle, you know, which a lot of people do that you, you actually, you know, got the courage to be able to go outside of that. Cause that's another barrier to breakthrough, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's it. yeah. So, um, well, I, we're running out of time here, but I, you know, there's a couple things. Uh, um, one is, um, I want to thank you and Heather, you guys are, in a, in a, um, in two very important careers, one as a nurse and one as a sheriff. And so thank you. Um, I know, um, and, and then also, you know, what, what's next for you guys? You guys are, you're 32, you hit your goal. Um, you know, you're going to have to change your Instagram name from first million to. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I'm not going to change it because, uh, I've kind of, it started out me trying to kind of post inspiring stuff for myself. And so that's why I call it your first million, because I want to show people, Hey, you know, my wife and I did this, you can do this too. And the market's changing and it's tough, but if you're, you know, if you can develop that discipline and, and set a goal, you know, you can do it too. Exactly. Um, so for sure. Next, I don't know what's next for us. Um, of course we set goals every year and I set goals every quarter as well. Um, I'm very big in goals and habits and discipline. Um, we're going to continue to, to buy rental properties. Um, we are looking for, um, kind of the next emerging market because even Kansas city has started to now kind of experience that peak a little bit too, but my next net worth goal is 10 million. And so that's what we're kind of pushing for. And it's, Good for you. Nice. Ways awesome. off <laughs> again. It's, it yeah. seems far, but I think we'll I, do it. I, I'm going to make a prediction. I I think you're going to do it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> cool. Well, we definitely want to mention uh, Joe's book, "The 24 Things That Helped Me Achieve One Million by the Age of sure. Thirty. Yeah, I got a copy of it here. Yeah, let's take a look um, at that thing. Nice. It's available on Amazon. Uh, you could just search my name in Amazon, Joseph Chantry. Um, and we have a Kindle version and an Audible version as well for those that like audiobooks. Great. But, and it's also available on your Instagram as well. Uh, I have a link to it on my Instagram. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, go check it out, you guys, because I mean, I know a lot of you are trying, even if you're over 30, trying to hit that $1 million mark. I mean, it can be done. You know, we've all done it. So if we can do it, you guys can do it. Yeah, yeah. And Joe, thanks, man. Thanks for uh, your inspiration. Thanks for everything you've done. Thanks for your discipline. Tell Heather, thank you. I I think that, uh, you know, as you know, like the more we can inspire people to take action and uh, you guys certainly did it while working full time. And um, uh, it, 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 people can do this, can't they? 
they can do it. it. It is tough, but they can do it. There's no reason you can't. Absolutely. Well, Joe, again, thank you. Let's keep oh, staying in touch. Thank you guys for having me. Yeah, very, I want to. Very appreciative. I want to way back in, you know, and see, uh, you know, see where you're headed next, because uh, I, I, I have a feeling that uh, it's going to be a very exciting run for you guys. Congratulations. Thank you.